So it's Thursday morning. <laughs> it's 9.30 a.m. in Europe. Um, and it's Space Cafe time. It's our Space Cafe Law Breakfast with Stephen Freeland. We'll begin very soon. Thank you for joining us for our breakfast roundtable today. You see this wonderful cafe house here in Cologne, where we came virtual to, together, unfortunately. But you will hear about it later. As always, I really appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. And I'm Torsten, the co-host of our, the event and publisher of Spacewatch.global. And we are a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. And I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment for keeping our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. In case you want to join our supporter team, it's just a click away on our website. Feel free or you just send me a message and ask me. I know many of you are familiar with our website, the bi-weekly and our daily newsletters and you might have seen this morning we had our 200th edition of our bi-weekly newsletter in a new design. We're keen to hear your feedback to that as well. And we also have the Space Cafe. So don't miss the latest one, which features Aaron Kemmer, the CEO and co-founder of multiple space ventures like Made in Space and Max Space, speaking about the transformative potential of in-space manufacturing. But we also and in space manufacturing obviously is a is a topic as well for our space cafe law breakfast at one time at one specific time we also have new episodes of the space cafe radios so from Glock with Aina Bjork the you 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 know sat you know sat you you and sat whatever it is um called um and um with Giovanni Pandolfi, the CSO and co-founder of Leaf Space in our Italian series. You can find our audios wherever you find your podcasts and listen to that. If you want to become a space watcher, let us let the world know that you are wearing a wonderful uh, space watcher t-shirt as um, Steven has it, or you have one of these super cool mugs here. Um, get to our website and um, join our fan shop. And again, all this merch is just a click away. If you've missed any of our web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on YouTube. And we will host our Space Cafe Law Breakfast, Stephen Freeland, live on a bi-monthly base. And it's our 14th edition, so we run it over three years now. Even so, that's pretty, pretty cool and impressive. With that, I'm handing over to your host in wonderful Sydney today, and we will all at one day follow his invitation to Down Under. Stephen, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Torsten. Thanks, my dear friend. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to edition 14 uh, of the Space Cafe Law Breakfast. And uh, what a fantastic uh, edition we've got. But it's a very sad day. Um, Firstly, we all wish um, our, our send our thoughts to everybody who's uh, undergoing terrible weather in uh, in Europe, particularly, and also in North America. Um, we hope you're safe and well, but um, sadly, we're hearing some difficult stories. And uh, really, you know, let's hope that uh, everybody gets safe through this well. And and of course, we had the sad news today, Torsten, didn't we, about uh, Sinead yep. O'Connor? Um, nothing compares to you, Torsten, as a co-host, but. Nothing, Nothing compared compares to her. to her, I would say. Yeah, exactly. So uh, sad day, but um, our thoughts are, are there about that. So let's begin. Um, Torsten, perhaps take off the slide and we can see who we've got here because we've got two amazing guests to talk about the wonders of space law and talk about a whole range of things. Um, my dear friend, Axel Tatier, and my other dear friend, Dr. Ingo Bauman, I'll introduce them shortly. Um, but first, the most important thing is, Torsten said, we're in this wonderful cafe in Bonn. Cologne. So, Cologne. In Cologne. Oh, oh yes. my God. In Bonn. <laughs> oh, Bonn is going to be our next one. We're in, we've got two gym. Oh, Ingo, I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> Ingo, we're here in uh, Köln. How could I? How could I do that? 
Um, hello to you and just tell us where are we and why are we here? Tell us about this cafe. Yeah, Stephen, uh, this is uh, the Café Salon Schmitz. It's quite a famous café in Cologne. It's located in the also famous Belgium quarter. Uh, it has its name because all the streets um, have names uh, after Belgium cities or regions. And it's, uh, let's say, the hotspot area in Cologne to go out at night to restaurant, bar, whatever. And uh, while it's a spe an especially nice cafe, as, as you see on the photo, it has a beautiful interior. So I thought yeah, that would be the right one to have our cafe this morning. Wonderful. I'm just looking at the top left uh, on your uh, there, the the icons on the on the wall. Does anyone know who they are? Ingo, do you know? Uh, not not exactly. It appears like old church uh, statutes, no? um, but I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know the background. You're happily invited to come physically to Cologne, and then we have a real cafe whenever oh, you well can. That would be great. We look forward to it. Um, and I'm sorry about saying Bonn, but as you'll hear later on, we're it's doing close Bonn by. <laughs> it's close by. by, and our airport is even called Cologne Bonn. Yeah, so that's right. That's right. <laughs> so thanks, uh, Ingo. Today we're going to talk about some really interesting things with uh, our two guests. We're going to focus on uh, the regulation of activities, um, particularly the regulation of space activities and how do space regulators, um, how, how do they meet the challenges in this rapidly changing technological ecosystem of space? So uh, we've got two incredible experts who can help us with that. We'll talk about uh, the impact of AI and machine learning and similar technologies in aviation and then how we might uh, look to the way that might influence space activities. And we'll look at other lessons that we might learn from the aviation industry, which is obviously considerably um, older, if you like, in terms of the experience. Um, what lessons can we learn from the aviation industry that might help us to deal with commercial interests in space, with innovation? These are... Um, fairly weighty questions. And uh, we've got, you know, two people who uh, really, I could not think of two better people to go, th go through these questions and really dissect and demystify some of the issues that arise. So firstly, we've got Axel Cartier. Hi, Axel. Axel Cartier, a dear friend of mine, um, a French lawyer, who's specialised in international air and space law for, golly, more than 20 years. She's got not one, not two, not three, but four master's degrees, really a, a bit of a glutton for punishment from uh, Sorbonne, from McGill, from Leiden and from the ISU. She's been a general counsel for US uh, um, aerospace company for 13 years and now has moved into aviation safety at the Joint Aviation Authorities, which was the predecessor of um, EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency. She's worked as a lawyer on many aspects, including civil aviation safety for a leading Dutch law firm. She's a member of the Space Economy Committee at the IAF. She's a certified instructor in international and European air law and policy for aviation professionals. She's a lecturer at the University of Sor Sorbonne, Paris 1 Sorbonne and University Toulouse Capital. She's published widely. She speaks at many conferences. Um, I first met her when she was a director of the Telders International Law Moot Court Competition. Golly, way back when, Axel. But out of her incredible experience there, she founded the first international um, air law moot court competition, which is organized by Leiden University and the Sarin Foundation. The list goes on. She's a member of the editorial board of the journal, the Annals of Air and Space Law for various work groups and aviation safety, security, um, for the French Society of Air and Space, 
European Aviation Club uh, and the International Institute of Space Law. She speaks French, English, Portuguese, and Dutch. She's just every, you know, the real Renaissance lady. But the most important thing is she's a passionate rugby supporter. And she's <laughs> a passionate rugby supporter of uh, the Toulouse Rugby Club. And she was telling me before we went on air that uh, three quarters of the French rugby team for the World Cup coming up, they come from Toulouse. Toulouse. So, Axel, we'll throw in some rugby uh, discussion somewhere along the line. And then we've got Ingo, Dr. Ingo Bauman, who you've just heard from previously, uh, one of the world's leading commercial lawyers, particularly in space and aerospace matters. He's the founding partner of the law firm BHO Legal in Köln, uh, specializing in national and international high technology projects, mostly in the space industry. Clients include the ones you would expect from a major law firm, uh, the European Commission, the European Space Agency, DLR, the German Space Agency, large operators, SMEs and startups. He studied at uh, Münster, at Köln, and received his PhD uh, under Dr. Stefan Holber at Köln, uh, looking at international law of satellite communications. For a, quite a number of years, he was in-house legal advisor at DLR. Um, he worked on the DLR's Galileo program office and uh, for a DLR subsidiary, the establishment of the German Galileo Control Center. He's a member of the ISL, the ECSL, and is a mentor to many people. Um, written some incredibly important books on commercial space law. He, he mentors startups within various incubators and accelerators in Germany and France, and chairs the legal regulatory working group of the BDI New Space Initiative. Welcome, Ingo. What a fantastic um, bio that both of you have. So welcome to uh, our discussion. The, most, the second most important question besides where are we is what is space? And as you know, we ask everybody who comes on the program to describe their one word for space. And, uh, Torsten has put on the screen there some of the words. In fact, these are all of the words from our 13 previous programs um, with all of our guests. You'll see that uh, Torsten's word, for example, is ambiguous, which I always love. Uh, and my word is intergenerational. So to add to the tradition, Axel, welcome again. What in one word is the way that you see space and the wonders of space and space law. Um, Stephen, you... Stephen, sorry for, for jumping in. We had it so easy because we started from the from a <laughs> That's right. of paper and we make it harder and harder for our guests to choose a new unique word. That's and right. Because we should appreciate our... their efforts as well. <laughs> That's right. The rule is that uh, any new guest can't choose one of the old or the words that's already been used. So. Uh, but I think that's great. We're going to have a book, Torsten and I, um, when we reach uh, 30 of these programs. So we'll have 60 words and we'll have a get everybody to write about their words and why, because it really does highlight the multifaceted nature of space. So Axel, let's add to the richness. What's your word for space? Well, I think you should put it in a, in a book and offer it to to you know the corpus or something in a in a very beautiful edition of some sort. I agree. <laughs> Eventually, um, but uh, yes, I did have to think about it, and and I thought you know let's add something. So I I have a French word, and it's not because I'm French, at all. Uh, and the word is avant-garde, and I suppose I should say it with avant-garde uh, in, <laughs> in English, um, but basically it is originally a military term, which of course it's, uh, it's uh, supposedly uh, negative, but uh, the space sector is so connected to the military applications that I think it's, it's quite uh, spot on, I think. Um, but also because we've learned from there, we moved on from there quite a lot uh, regarding the peaceful use uh, of outer space. And you know very well with the Milamos project, which is a beautiful uh, uh, 
project with uh, uh, Miguel, uh, so you you know uh, more I think more than anyone in this room uh, uh, about about that. But also uh, because there's innovation, and innovation is part of avant-garde, and avant-garde is usually uh, used for culture. Uh, and uh, since we have Germans in the room right now, uh, we have uh, between France and Germany uh, a lot regarding culture movements, uh, you know, Romanticism, uh, Dadaism, I mean, it's, the list goes on and on. And I think avant-garde is also part of it. And it's, it's really about the boundaries, uh, pushing the boundaries of ideas and creativity. Uh, but you still have to be mindful of, of human safety and environment. And this is why I thought, uh, to me at least, is, is a word that I could come up with. Oh, it's a wonderful word. Um, yes. Thank you. And uh, who would have thought, Torsten, we'd have Dadaism uh, <laughs> referred to in our Faith Cafe breakfast. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Axel. It really does add uh, another perspective to space. Um, Ingo, it's a tough act to follow. But um, what, how would you describe space in one word? Well, honestly, I found it easy to find a word and I was uh, surprised that it was not yet on the list. My word is geopolitical. Mm. And uh, of course, uh, space, space, space law uh, have uh, essential roots in geopolitical matters in the Cold War discussions between the US and Russia. Uh, for some years, maybe this has been a bit less in the focus, but now, of course, no, uh, it's again uh, on the first line. And um, while geopolitics is also a bit blocking the further development uh, of space law, uh, and we have essential discussions uh, with geopolitical background, of course, on on anti-satellite weapons, but also on 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 space resources, and, and so on. And uh, there is also an even nicer word, uh, astropolitical, which was introduced mm -hmm. by some author already some fifteen years ago or so. And uh, yeah, just uh, just a little book recommendation. There is uh, a very interesting book right out uh, right out by uh, UK author Tim Marshall, The Future of Geography. And that's about, in fact, astropolitics. And I can, I just read it myself and I can really uh, recommend it. Oh, thank you. And I think you're so right. I mean, just the work that I find myself doing at COPOS, the geopolitics uh, really trumps everything. And it makes you realize sometimes how geopolitics uh, alters the way that countries and, and the decision makers make their decisions. You know, rationality is not necessarily always there in decisions because geopolitics is so important. So thank you, Ingo, for reminding us about that aspect of space, and it's really important. So I think we'll come back to both of those issues, the innovation through avant-garde and the geopolitics of space in, in our discussions today. Um, so let's let's sort of move on. I mean, we're all aware, of course, and I say this almost in every breakfast about how the rapid development of space technology over the past, let's say, two decades has meant that the way we utilize space the benefits we can gain from space, the way we vision space, uh, the technological um, possibilities become broader and broader and broader when it comes to space. But we've got to regulate this because we all understand the challenges, many of which have been discussed in the past, and the complexities of space, including the geopolitics, of course, and the growing private sector development. So there's an increasing need for governments to develop regulatory frameworks at the national level to augment, complement, implement the international frameworks. Ingo, you deal with this, these issues all the time. So perhaps to help us put it all in context, could you perhaps describe to us in general terms how you see the role of national space law, how it fits in with international space law, and then putting yourself in the mind's eye of a regulator, how does a regulator deal with the challenges as the technology just becomes more and more complex and diverse? It's a tough one, isn't it? 
Yeah, well, yeah, it, it could fill the whole the whole hour. Yeah? Um, well, well, let's start with the easy part. No? The the relation uh, to to between national and international uh, space law. The the, the the international space law demands uh, the states to uh, authorize and to supervise uh, non-governmental space activities. Yeah, so it's even it's even an international law duty. Um, there are also other aspects like the interest of states uh, to slow down uh, their own liability obligations to non-governmental non operators and to take recourse if really something happens, space object registration. Now also, of course, the environmental sustainability aspects come more and more in, into the focus. But that's that's a rather easy part. No? If When I heard the first time about national space law, it was a bit more than 22 years ago, my, my colleague, Michael Gerhardt, some of you may may know him. He is now yeah. in aviation, but he brought uh, his PhD about, and I think it was the for, first one globally. Um, and at that time, we had only something like eight to ten countries with national space law. Of course, you know, the leading space powers at the time, U.S., uh, Russia, um, but even countries like France. Uh, had no national space law. It came in only in 2008, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And um, so it was a very small number of states, and, and some of these didn't even have uh, a considerable space industry and space uh, activities. Um, this has dramatically changed. No? Now we see um, new companies, not even in Europe, Australia, but, but also in Africa, in Asia, in South America, around the globe. Uh, we see the industry emerging and, and lots of uh, startup companies. Um, this is, of course, made easier by cheaper technology, faster production, cheaper launch cost, et cetera, et cetera, which makes it uh, more easy to enter into the business. And um, that's why we see also an increasing number of countries implementing national space laws. Those having it are undergoing reforms and reviews and amendments, uh, et cetera, and many, uh, many countries are at least working on preparing uh, national space legislation. That's also the case in Germany, where, in fact, we are hmm. working on it since something ah, between ah. 20 or 25 years. No? One day we will have one. It will certainly be the most brilliant and best one in the world, ah, ah. likely. Yeah? But of course, it, uh, of course. We, we need a, uh, we need a lot, of, lot of time. Yeah, And while well, the... The, the difficulty has always been, let's say, to, of course, no, ensure the safety of the space activities, protect uh, the people, protect health, protect uh, state interests, uh, security, um, and, and even sustainability was always a topic. But um, now we have um, we have a, a new era, really. No, the the it we had in the past very few actors very big actors, um, very professional actors. And it was, let's say, for a state and the competent authority, it was rather easy to deal with one or two actors, yeah? one big launch provider, one big satellite operator. Okay, yeah? not so many actors, very professional interaction, very little uh, diversity, no? mostly launch and satellite communications, later a bit of commercial Earth observation, but we had nothing like big constellation on orbit servicing, uh, in space manufacturing, um, et cetera, et cetera, all these different new applications, uh, radio frequency monitoring, and all these applications we, we now have. You know? So uh, that's really becoming a big, big uh, challenge. Yeah, it is. And it's interesting you were talking about the, um, the early days of space law in Australia. And you uh, you probably you know that we had space law already in 1998 um, with a relatively very small space sector, apart from one or two communications companies. And the whole raison d'etre of our space 
law in Australia was to develop a launch industry. We still don't have the launch industry. We've got everything and many other things. And so, you know, and we've had to revise the legislation accordingly. So you're absolutely right. You know, it's 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 an ongoing work in progress. And so thank you for sharing that with us. Axel, you know, you've just heard now how important it is to regulate and increasingly so. Um, we need to see how regulators deal with the innovative activities, the avant-garde activities in space, how do they struggle to keep abreast with technology. So you're an expert in both fields, right? And in that crossover between aviation regulation and space regulation, as I mentioned, obviously the space sector, the aviation sector, excuse me, has been around for a long time. How have regulators in the aviation sector dealt with changes in technology, given the safety is, you know, preeminently important? And, and are there lessons in terms of the way they've been able to pivot around the technology in the aviation sector that might help us navigate change, the challenges that Ingo talked about for space? Um, yes, um, so I, I think the, the, you just spoke about safety and, and safety, of course, for, for us is, is first, and I, I don't say it's not the case for space, uh, but the aviation sector, it's the official uh, permanent first goal uh, of the ICAO, uh, and the International Civil Aviation Organization, uh, which it basically deals with international civil aviation. Uh, so this is number one. Um, but what is very important, too, is airspace uh, sovereignty. Uh, and 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 mm. the states are very very uh, uh, jealous of their sovereignty, and this is this is not a joking matter, obviously. But but there is because of these uh, two um, uh, very important uh, aspects, uh, there's a huge amount of uh, compromise and and consensus. Um, and, and so with that, I think you can have already a living playing field of what uh, can be allowed uh, to, to, to change things. Um, you have uh, examples, of course, but uh, I just wanted to put forward, for example, something called responsive regulation, uh, which a lot of states, uh, not so many states, but, but specific states that are very influential in aviation, for example, Brazil, uh, have put forward officially, it's officially in the law, uh, in Brazil, uh, with a civil aviation authority called ANAC, uh, that has it officially uh, uh, as a as a operating mode to some extent, uh, and it's really to adapt regarding uh, yes the market because it's also that I mean you can't you can't just pretend it's not there, and they really have adopted. Um, for example, you can just be uh, you can buy as a foreign investor 100% of an airline. Uh, which is something mm -hmm. that uh, you don't have uh, in a lot of countries. Uh, first of all, in Europe, you can't. I mean, legally, uh, the maximum is famous 51% uh, 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 that you can't touch. So it has to be under 51. Uh, in the States, you, you can't, absolutely not. It's, uh, it's by uh, Congress. Uh, Congress can never authorize any American entity uh, to uh, company or anything uh, to have an investor for more than 25%. Uh, so Brazil has adapted uh, quite uh, drastically uh, in that respect. Um, but you also have that for airport concessions. So you have airport concessions, you have uh, uh, airports in Brazil that has been, all of the airports will be uh, under concession and uh, very few of these uh, are Brazilians. So it's, it's quite uh, something that's, uh, again, has is in a, to adapt also within, of course, very strict uh, laws and very strict regulation as to how it can happen, what kind of financing, what kind of uh, quality and control uh, all that, and of course, the uh, ICAO uh, um, framework in all this. So that would be, um, I think, an example, but also um, is, is that we, we we can see we, we learned a lot because aviation, yes, is older than space, but maritime is even older. So uh, mm. aviation is a is a um, modest field. It's a field full of humility. I think it's something that is very important when you work with safety to to stay humble, um, and. Uh, to stay to, to to have innovation but stay humble um, and this means you have to be cautious as well uh, regarding for example flags flags of convenience this is something we learned from the, the maritime of the law of the sea 
uh, worlds and we made it very different in aviation. Uh, it's it's uh, very difficult to, if you want to have flags of convenience, it's almost impossible to have in aviation. So we have very specific uh, regulation for that. Um, not to say it's necessarily a bad thing, uh, but it's just to make sure that we uh, uh, we learned from a from predecessor. Uh, so I think space can learn as well from that perspective and, and take what is feasible, what is uh, good uh, to take away. Um, and again, again, very importantly, is a consensus. Consensus, I'm sorry, uh, which of course is a key word at the COPOS because it's the only way it can be can be done. Uh, but ICAO as well, you have a lot, lot, lot of consensus, and it's, it may take some time. But you do adapt, and uh, I think I'll talk a bit later about that, but regarding uh, the Corsia, Corsia is the environmental uh, approach mm. to protection, but existed before COVID. So this is one of the, um, you know, maybe aviation has a nose for, <laughs> for what will come, but it's also because we look around and it's also learning with space because uh, there is this uh, um, air and space connection at ICAO as well. So it is not uh, ignoring <laughs> the other sectors. Um, and of course, states learn from other states. If you are within ICAO, then you're more likely to perhaps see, uh, is it something we can do, this responsive regulation? Is it something we, we could do uh, for at least some of, some of what we allow to do within, uh, within our, our legal framework? Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, uh, Ingo, you know, I, I was, as I was listening to Axel, you obviously safety is the preeminent um, criteria, if you like, for the way we regulate uh, commercial aviation for obvious reasons. We have a different perspective about what safety is in space. I mean, we're obviously conscious with launches about safety on the ground. We understand that. But, you know, because by and large, we haven't had too many humans uh, as cargo, if you like. <laughs> um, and, and, and so I suppose in your practice, you deal with regulators all the time. Um, and you deal with industry all the time. What do you think industry looks for from the regulators and the regulation, given that it's a different perspective about safety? You know, it's it's more about perhaps commerciality in a, of a different sort. Do you mm. think the industry wants more certainty from their regulators or more flexibility? Do you think the industry wants... Uh, you know, like a, a free market, a, a, an openly competitive space sector, or a controlled one. Do you think the industry? I, I, I think it's yeah. both. I think it's both, yeah. no, Stephen. Of course, um, transparency, predictability, reliability um, of regulatory frameworks is always important for industry, not only not only in space, but but here as well. Yeah. So and also investors, no, of course, have, have a long term perspective. They they want to have certainty that, uh, let's say, something will be authorized and will stay authorized and, and uh, how much it will cost, what what will be the effort, what will be the impact. So uh, a lot on, on this side is uh, certainly also driven by investors. No? But I would say what, what the industry needs or, or requests is uh, before everything is speed. Yeah? And that's also mm -hmm. some of the new um, some of the new aspects, because in the past, well, uh, geostationary satellites, no, construction three to four years. So you had a lot of time to prepare the licensing process. And in fact, there were also very few models, no? like we have in the, in the aviation industry. Of course, there are lots of airlines, but there are very few uh, big manufacturers. So in, in terms of the safety of the models no, in our in, in the space now, the satellite buses or the the different launch vehicles, they are very few. No? The operators are increasing, but uh, um, satellite manufacturers are now also increasing. Launch vehicle producers are increasing. So we see a, a big increase in new models, let's say. And, and that's, again, one of the challenges because each and every model needs to be checked for safety. 
Yeah. But okay, coming back to, to speed, yeah? also we see extremely rapid market developments, yeah? uh, technology developments, and and again, the investors, yeah? uh, venture capitalists, of course, they, they, they have a very fast, fast track horizon to make uh, to make revenue yeah, to, to uh, uh, three to five years where already they plan for exit with a lot of profit. So there's also a lot of speed pressure on, on that side. And um, that really contrasts with what we see in, in many countries now concerning the regulatory processes where it takes easily a year and sometimes even up to two years to get yeah, from your license application until the the yeah. license is really granted. So two years time to get this in in some cases, and and of course, right, in that time the the market, the competition, the technology already has changed uh, a lot. Yeah, so uh, that's that's now really one of of uh, the pressure points on the regulators. Uh, how to be rather fast, how to be responsive, proactive, however you want to call it, yeah, and and support the competitiveness of your national industry, uh, etc., by being rather fast, but nevertheless, yeah, be prudent, be precise, and ensure the safety, security, sustainability, and so on. Yeah, that's that's the wow. We don't pay regulators a lot of money, and it sounds like they should be paid a lot more. I mean, it's a tough job. Tor Torsten, uh, one of the things that is an open debate for me, and you talk to them all uh, about industry, and given everything that Axel and Ingo have said, is industry sometimes always says to me, you've got to fail to succeed, you know, and, and in fact, Elon Musk says that famously, right, you know, with the last starship, you know, we saw it explode, but it was a brilliant failure, a really successful failure, if you like. Um, and yet, and yet, you know, the other side of the balance that Ingo was just talking about, you know, prudence and getting it right. So what do you think the mood is in the industry? You know, are they too open to failure? And is government not open enough to failure? Uh, do you need to fail to succeed in this industry? What, what do you think as an engineer, but also talking to the industry? That's, that's not an easy one to answer. No, no. Of course not, because it came from you. <laughs> so um, my five cent on that is that um, we have in the behavior, how we deal with failure um, or non-success, a very bigot behavior. We on one side we say, okay, we are we are fine, we are tolerant to that, but when it happens, we are not. Mm. I mean, there is it, of course, on the on the official headlines. Yes, we will do it again, la 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 la. But at the end, we are not dealing with it in an in an in a very tolerant way, and that goes back then to the industry because every failure cost money. Every failure has an impact on your balance sheet, has an impact on your income, on your potential reputation, on all of these things. And are we really that tolerant? Definitely not here in Europe or in it's speaking for Germany, not at all. And even in the US, where it seems to be more tolerant, yeah, you change hats, you change people, and then look at Japan. I mean, we have seen lately the ice base, the hard landing of the mm. ice base lander. And I mean, you know that I've been engaged with, with one of these moon uh, um, projects um, quite some time ago. And I mean, they said, yeah, we're going for the next mission and everything is planned. But boy, I think that's that's a hard way. I mean, we have seen it with the Israelians. They said after they, they, uh, they, they hard landed, yes, we do it again. Bereshit too, no problem at all. And a few months back, Khan pulled the, the, the plug and said, oh, no, we will spend the, the money for projects that are more important for us now. That is what I mean with it's, it's quite begot our, our behavior. You're saying 
really mixed signals like you know we say of course we understand you need space is hard but we still don't necessarily accept when it goes wrong even though we you know it's natural that things will yeah. go wrong i mean if that's, yeah, I if that's a small mistake yeah i mean my call is is really i i would like to and i i love it when you say it or we have to pay our regulators more i mean i i'm oh, 10 years ago, I would have bit, bitten on my tongue of saying <laughs> that, that I'm, I'm calling for more regulation in that in that space, because we have this prestige space that we have to protect. And we talk about space debris and all of that and space safety and security, but we keep on doing as we have done it before. Particularly, there are few countries that calling for maybe some voluntary activities or guidelines that we want to apply. But no hard. I mean, if I want to send my Torsten Sat one uh, into space, I can. And flag of convenience. If I fly it from 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 India or from wherever, nobody cares about it. And my government, Outer Space Treaty. I mean, you guys know it better. You are lawyers. Uh, Article six or uh, or paragraph six. I mean, has to supervise my my activities. Mm, sure. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why. Uh, Ingo, you've got to get that German legislation. Uh, you, you've got to put Torsten through uh, a rigorous process to applica for application. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. On that I note, hope I we have it I, before I Torsten it, that one will. <laughs> 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 but um, Stephen, you you know that there was an, mm. uh, an, an official hearing in in Germany uh, for the new uh, strategy and the, yeah. and the law, and we as press were not even invited to that process. So. Guess why? I understand. I mean, I well, know how to make friends. <laughs> well, that's right. As I said, nothing compares to you, Tos. <laughs> um, well, I mean, this this leads to what I wanted to speak to uh, to Excel about about AI and machine learning and technology, and because you know we're we've incorporated AI technology in aviation in a way to promote efficiency, security, safety. Um, but of course, as you've said, the emphasis is on safety. Um, but how is the movement uh, towards AI learning and automation? You know, we hear about automatic, automatic pilots and now some planes talking about having just one pilot and, you know, all of those things. Golly, I don't want to know about that plane if I'm on it. Um, that movement towards AI, though, is happening for all sorts of economic reasons also in, in the aviation industry. Um, how has that been managed, given, as you've always said, that safety is preeminent? You know, um, uh, we can't even get automatic cars right yet, although we're moving that way. So to have automatic pilots where you, you know, a mistake is certain death for 400 people. So how is how is the aviation industry and particularly uh, the regulation of that and the accountability for that coped with AI? And then Ingo, I'm going to come to you about <laughs> how that works in the space as well. So Axel? Uh, yes, uh, a lot can be said about that. Um, re regarding, I just want to say right away regarding the the, the only one pilot um we have uh, this is a thing with aviation as well is that um um there's a learning process as well but there's also a, a grieving process as well if i could say it like that uh for example regarding the german wings um, mm. and, um yeah. and we know what happened there we know the conclusions uh but but there's no way uh, at the moment i mean it's if you talk about uh, only one pilot on board uh lucky for us we have in the uh, Council of ICAO. Council of ICAO is is uh, um, uh, basically there are uh, limited numbers of states represented there, but one of them is the United States, and uh, his name is uh, Captain Sully Berger. Uh, so Captain Sully, uh, the famous pilot who landed uh, the aircraft on the River Hudson. So he's yeah. 
very, very clear as to uh, no, we need two pilots at least in the cockpit. So um, it, it, just, just, just if you, uh, for anyone listening, I think you should have a look. Uh, in, he publishes quite a lot uh, in that respect on LinkedIn. He has a very interesting um, uh, safety hour or safety moments. It's, it's really, really uh, uh, very nice to 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 read it. Also because he's very much aware of his role as an ambassador uh, at uh, at ICAO. Um, but regarding, uh, of course, it, it is a debate that stays. It's not going to go away. We can talk about it, but it's it's again really learning uh, uh, from from experiences, uh, unfortunately, uh, incidents, but also unfortunately, uh, accidents. Um, and of course, it's uh, um, also to do with resilience. I think it's a word that that I didn't say yet for aviation. Uh, it's a very resilient. Uh, um, sector. I mean, we have survived quite a lot of things, including uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. not we still uh, financially, we still, uh, uh, we're not struggling anymore. So already I say, I say we, I allow myself to say we, uh, but all stakeholders have, have really recovered quite, uh, quite, I think, rapidly, um, still ongoing. But resilience is also about redefining risks. So what are the actual risks? And when it comes to safety, this is very, um, you know, looked at very carefully. Um, so you do have, uh, um, Already quite a lot that has been done. I mean, in in uh, in uh, uh, EI, you have, we have it. Uh, for example, in the maintenance, maintenance uh, a lot is done already. It's automatic. What you have to do, what you have to check, and uh, what kind of aircraft. Uh, if it's uh, if it's Embraer, if it's Boeing, if it's Airbus, uh, what kind of model? Um, with a Bombardier, you know, it ended up being the A220, uh, which is a beautiful aircraft, by the way. <laughs> Fluid. Mm. That two weeks ago is gorgeous. Um, so you know all that is is already in, and there's, there's, uh, we all scared if Chat GBT is used in there one day. But we have to to also consider that you will have something equivalent to it eventually uh, for all the process regarding quality and control, for example. Um, and this is maintenance and and, and all that. Um, but just to say on one thing is that aviation uh, started really on uh, to actually forbid anything flying. And this was uh, in 18... Uh, <laughs> 84, a long time ago, and he was in France. I don't say it's because he was French or because he was a Montgolfier brothers who were probably uh, insane, but uh, ah. they <laughs> flew this Montgolfier uh, with uh, a duck and a sheep and, and some animals. Uh, but then the police uh, uh, head of Paris said, no way, you're not flying anything because the main concern was the ground. So the very first aspect is not just the passengers and, and the cargo, and it's really the ground. So third-party third liability is also part of, of a thinking. Um, and so eventually the, the king flew himself, and then the, this idea of forbidding anything flying ever uh, was taken away quickly. But because, first of all, you had this flight, uh, where, by the way, the animal survived uh, at least the flight. I don't know after, but um, so this is basically, uh, uh, I think, important to see that for us, the final frontier, I mean, we do have this Article 8 in the Convention of ICAO that is about pilotless aircraft, and it was written in 19, 1944. So think about that. It's it's unbelievable. It was already in. Um, but it's still not automatic. As you can see, it's still not, but everybody says, yeah, let's, let's do it. And as we have right now, these, these beautiful drones, uh, it is to bring medications, it is to help a fire brigade, uh, but it's not with plenty of passengers all over the place. And although the Olympics in France next uh, next year in Paris, they, they said, oh, we're going to have these air taxis. Well, I'm willing to see that. I'd love to see mm. it. But um, they already can't build a proper metro between the airports oh. and Paris. So I'm not sure about that. But you have wonderful companies that really work very hard on that, and they're very serious about it, and they're very cautious. Uh, Joe B for is one of them uh, with these famous EV tolls, and honestly, they, they're progressing very rapidly with a lot of support from the FAA, so the the, the Civil Aviation Authority of the US. So it's not uh, ignoring, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's really implementing a lot uh, in all this. And right now we have segregated airspace, so we don't have yet a fully integrated airspace. Uh, let us see, but what is certain is that you also have, I think, an interesting question, which is uh, who owns the airspace above cities? 
And also this is a very, uh, I don't have an answer for you right now. I mean, uh, yes, states have it, but city halls, uh, a group of cities, uh, regions, uh, uh, how does that work? Uh, if you fly above the, the Basque country, uh, the Spanish one, and then you move to the Basque uh, uh, French uh, one, then, then what happens? I mean, who, who is, so this is, this is a, a debate actually, which started through these companies. They're the ones who went to the States and saying, uh, hello, who is, uh, who is owning the, the airspace above cities? Um, so this is one of the aspects I think that uh, um, it, it really is all the stakeholders are included, uh, including the police, including, uh, I mean, uh, name it, uh, insurers, we, we never speak about insurance, but they're there. Um, and this is a very important part. And this is why ICAO works heavily with all parties involved, including the industry. Um, so this is something that uh, I, I thought I was just up here. I could go on for a while, but this is, yeah. this is definitely. But just one last thing. Sorry, I wanted to quote uh, Blériot. Uh, and again, you'll tell me it's French. You're really uh, so, so French and all that. Uh, yes, I know, but Blériot uh, did cross the channel with his uh, aircraft in 1909. But he already said back then that it's not the resistance of uh, the physical resistance that you have in the air in any case, it's not this that will uh, limit the performance of what he, what he used to call the artificial bird. So this was the aircraft, he called it artificial mm -hmm. bird. And he says, it's not the physical resistance that will stop the aircraft, but the, the brain of a human being. Um, so I'll leave you with wow. that. I think it's that great. Is, it goes that, that's, that's fascinating. And, and you know, for us in, in the more in the space world, um, you know, AI is obviously increasingly being used for data, you know, to, to analyze data. But Ingo, you know, AI is now be becoming increasingly a part of space systems, you know, and, and we're going to have uh, more and more automation, more and more machine learning. It's important, it's necessary, and it will allow us to do more things in space. But there are real questions about accountability, aren't there? I mean, our some would say antiquated, but our liability regime doesn't really know how to cope with situations where increasingly humans are not in the loop as much. And mm. um, so, so how do you see, I mean, it's a necessity, but how do you see the increasing use of AI systems and similar technologies in space? How do you see that in terms of regulation for accountability when things go wrong? Because they will. Uh, and can you see, for example, us having fully automated space systems where humans are really not in the loop anymore? And if so, how do we regulate that? You know, mm. um, are, the, are the possibilities, are we limited by our brain, as Axel quoted? Or are the possibilities for space limitless, as Mark said in the um, in the chat? And if they are limitless, how will we be able to regulate that? No. Yeah. Good questions. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would say it's it's generally it's less critical than in many other areas, no? including aviation, because as you said also earlier, while well, there are not so many humans involved, there are also uh, human right aspects or, or mm. personal data protection is is not so critical in the space industry at, at least not yet and for the for the years to come yeah? that that may change in 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 the far future but certainly not not today yeah? um for what I what I find interesting, but it leads somewhere else. Now, if you take uh, the use of AI in uh, data, no, Earth observation data, um, already pre-selection, pre-processing, analytics, no, merging, etc., uh, etc. Et um, um, While well, if you look to to all the standard industry terms and conditions, it all in excludes warranty liability to the utmost yeah. extent. Yeah, so. Um, whether or not it's done with AI or not, yeah? and then, but that, that's maybe a topic for for another cafe. Uh, there's uh, all these uh, far-reaching exclusions of uh, warranty liability are really still adequate, and 
justified and so on and so on but uh, of course, you know, the issue comes if we uh, if we speak about in space operations and and really automatic operations. And AI, one of the uses of AI is uh, is in uh, collision avoidance, yeah, um, in operations of especially constellations and and prediction, also prediction of conjunctions, and then automatic uh, collision avoidance. And of course, something can go wrong. Yeah, there might be. Uh, a wrong estimate, a wrong decision by by the AI, and that may lead to uh, uh, a collision and 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 damage and third party liability claims. While we know no, these discussions on liability in space so far are mostly uh, academic. No? We have seen very few cases, and the few cases they were handled a bit diplomatic behind closed doors, uh, etc. <clears throat> but it, it will come uh, one day sooner or later. And then uh, if that decision yeah, was uh, done by AI, it's it's even more difficult to determine fraud. And, and as we know, no, liability convention, etc. If it happens in space, they need to be fought. And how, ca how can you do that? No? And uh, well, here are, I think, the, the interesting questions. For the time being, more academic, but I'm sure if we come back to another cafe in five years' time, it will probably already look differently. No, I agree. I mean, uh, three or four years ago, my dear friend Alex Suchek and I wrote the problem for the Manfred Lax boot court competition, and it was exactly the scenario you said. Two systems each, and, and it mirrored the technology that has already been developed two systems, each of them using automatic collision avoidance. And of course, <laughs> both of them acting irrationally in a sense because they're reacting towards the other one and, and, and we had a collision. And it was really amazing to hear all of the arguments by the students about how you try to take a 1970s uh, human-based liability system and apply it to that sort of uh, arrangement. We've got a lot of work and, and no doubt it'll, um, Ingo, as you say, it will come up. Um, Axel, um, we're sort of getting running out of time, but I'm really interested just to hear from you about dispute resolution because we see um, ICAO the, being involved more and more and taking a really proactive view in really high profile disputes, including MH17, which, you know, is, is something that I've been following quite closely, quite extraordinary. Um, the dispute resolution mechanisms for space um, in the treaties are, you know, there are some, but, but it's really about negotiation, as Ingo said. Obviously, in commercial contracts, um, lawyers will include some dispute resolution, but I'm interested in the ICAO, the, the um, the supernatural body really taking the dispute resolutions. We don't have that in space in the same way. We've got courts, of course, but not the space body. So perhaps briefly, if you could, because I've got other things to ask you both, what lessons can we learn from that and maybe apply to space? Or are there lessons to be learned from the way aviation deals with it at that supernatural level? Um, well, uh, at first I can say that ICAO is a full agency, if I can say it like that, and I don't say it in a way which is to, to, to shame a space in any way. It's, just, <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that is there. 193 states, so it gives uh, quite a good idea of, of uh, uh, basically pretty much any state in the world is in there. There's a couple missing, but it's really essentially the whole world. Um, so it's it's quite in very interesting uh, because very recently ICAO uh, has now uh, reviewed is now actually reviewing the rules of procedure for 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 the um, a resolution of disputes. So it is in the in the Article eighty four of the Chicago Convention. So it's in, it's in there. Uh, but it wasn't used a lot. And so uh, when I was studying at uh, McGill last century, uh, you know, when they were telling us about it, it was essentially regarding territorial disputes, uh, of course, sovereignty always, always. So we're looking at uh, 
uh, some some uh, you know India Pakistan Pakistan India were, were, were the first um, then you had UK Spain uh, uh, when you had uh, Cuba versus the United States but this was in the 90s so you have a kind of jump from the 50s and then a bit of the 70s and then to the 90s and now we have a, a bit more but totally we have only 10 10 disputes so it's it's mm. Um, a, a lot, what is very important to say, I think, is that we can learn a lot. The only thing is the merits have never been published. There's no, there's no merits because there was an agreement uh, reached um, before, I mean, to, 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 end, uh, to end the dispute. Um, so there was never a merit. So mm. from that perspective, uh, this is a part we, we're going to miss uh, as lawyers, as, as uh, uh, you know, as, as stakeholders. It's difficult to, to know exactly. Uh, but but it is definitely, um, I think the fact that very few disputes is a good sign. Uh, it's a good sign to say that we, we generally have a lot which is dealt with at ICAO, outside ICAO, at countries. Uh, European Union sometimes will, will act as, as, you know, uh, um, as a party to, to see, okay, there's something that can be done. Um, so it's not necessarily reaching that stage. Um, you mentioned, of course, the the MH17, which of course is 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 so incredible. Uh, I mean, it's it's an absolute tragedy. Uh, but everything that has come out of it since has been uh, quite exceptional in the degree of uh, first you had a trial in the Netherlands. Um, you have uh, it's now before the, the court uh, in Strasbourg, so the European Court of Human Rights is also there. Um, so it's it's really the Netherlands have done everything, uh, uh, it's it, everywhere it, it should be. Uh, and this is quite exceptional, I think, from, from this country, which normally acts as a diplomatic country. I don't know how to say it uh, differently. I don't mean the other countries are not, but the Netherlands, uh, because maybe they're a smaller country by size, uh, they, they have always been very much more involved in diplomacy. Uh, from that perspective. Um, they have intervened a lot with the Lockerbie trial, uh, and the, you might remember that this was in the Netherlands, of course, under Scottish jurisdiction, uh, but the Libya trusted the Netherlands, they didn't trust any other states in Europe to be able to, you know, so it's it's really quite typical of the Netherlands. This time the Netherlands are victims. Um, so they, they've been, I think, extremely brave, uh, very competent as well. They, 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 they really I think very impressive in, in the dignity as well in, in what they've done. Um, and of course, Australia is, is a party to, to. And so what is unique is there is that it's the first time that we have Article 3 bis, which ends up before the council. And Article 3 bis is essentially uh, a result of the Korean Airlines aircraft, uh, CAL 007, mm -hmm. which was shot down in 1983 by Soviet Union. Uh, and this aircraft, they knew it was a civil aircraft. This has been proven, uh, they knew. Uh, uh, but uh, the point is that um, it will be, you know, it's, 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 it will, maybe it will be the first case ever that we have the merits. I don't know. What is certain is that it takes time, that it takes time. Um, several years, sometimes uh, we have a case still uh, uh, open from 2016, um, so it takes it takes a bit of time, but it's, I think, worth it uh, if we can reach an agreement. Um, the only thing is right now, of course, Russia, the Russian Federation is a considered an aggressor state, um, so this is also unique uh, um, in, in the previous cases we had, which had nothing to do with anything of the kind. Um, so this is also to see that things grow based on an article that was uh, enacted in 1984 uh, and that was uh, added to the convention. So we, we have the means, we have the means, the legal means to, to make uh, law progress. And so how could it be uh, useful for space? Uh, well, first of all, because uh, again, not so many cases, so it means there's an immense effort of diplomacy uh, behind, uh, which I think for space will be the same. I don't see it differently <clears throat> because we also have a lot of private actors uh, involved in aviation, not as as not as parties to ICAO, no, but they're definitely involved. They, they are uh, concerned. It's about safety, concerns us all. Um, and uh, um, it could be that the industry, because now we have a lot more industry um, uh, stakeholders, that could be less attractive, uh, attracted to that kind of, of system. Yeah. With uh, however, maybe in, in the future, if there's no agency coming, I mean, uh, agency with the powers of ICAO, um, 
it could be Ikeo deals with some of the space disputes, but that's, that's a possibility, definitely. Is it something that states wants? I, I, I'm not sure, but it's definitely a, a academically a worthy discussion. Uh, and there has been, I think, quite a good results uh, so far. Um, last thing, uh, Ikeo is, of course, uh, it's not the International Court of Justice. Uh, so we don't have independent judges. Uh, this has been also written in the um, ICJ uh, case of 2000 and, uh, sorry, 2020, 14th of July, uh, involving Qatar um, and other states, neighboring states, and it was this issue of this closed airspace. Uh, and so this is this case where they reiterate to say that's very nice, but ICAO hang on, uh, they're not judges, they're not independent judges, so they write it differently, of course, but it's it's just basically to say um, that ICAO, the council, they are representing their states, so you have to see it from a perspective, uh, how do we go to, to want to go about it, uh, and, and this is, um, but another expert, I think an expert in the field is definitely a, a Dr. Jerry Go, a scholar, and, and I think she can do uh, quite a lot with that, and I'll be happy to to discuss with her further if, uh, if that's uh, of value. Mm. Thank you, thank you. That's really interesting, although uh, for another over a beer one day, I'll, I, I slightly disagree with you that everything's been done on MH17. I'm an advocate for also the International Criminal Court acting, and, and you know, but anyway, we've had that discussion. Um, before we move to the reality check of Torsten, and time always moves on, and bearing in mind um, uh, the the questions that we had uh, in in the chat, the first question that came from uh, Tama. Let me ask Ingo and Axel one last thing, um, and it sort of takes into account Tamasa's excellent question. If there was one thing, one change, one thing we need to change for the regulatory framework for space uh, to make it better suited for the constantly changing technology and geopolitics and all of that, what would that be? Inga, so what's your one, one magic one change? Hmm. Well, that's really a difficult question. Ah. Uh, um, hmm. um, I mentioned already speed. Yeah, well, that's that's certainly from from the industry side. We 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 heard responsiveness or proactiveness. Yeah. Um, The, the the question is no, more and more countries have legislation we know they are strongly diverging so far that has this has not created a problem but we have seen some signs of let's say lack of convenience uh behavior some very early uh signs no? some some companies really changing countries to 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 go to a more uh supportive however you call that uh, regime or or some countries uh, implement trying or working on to implement proactive legislation attracting companies you know, uh, offering more attractive more soft uh, and so on so i would say in the mid mid term um, um some more while I wouldn't call it harmonization, yeah, but but something in that direction probably will be needed to avoid uh, really a future with a lack of convenience um, uh, situations, which which will undermine, let's say, the safety, which will lead to to conflicts, which will lead to many unwanted things. Yeah, but yeah. it's more it's more a midterm uh, perspective. Yeah, I understand, but it's an important one. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, Axel, what's your one change to the space sector, the regulation? So for me, it would be regarding the resilience aspects. And, and, and I say that because th there's so many lessons learned still uh, from, um, from the pandemic. And I'm sorry to go back to it. Nobody wants to hear about it, I know. Uh, but... <laughs> 
it's it's very because it's it really the work that has been done at IKEA. I, I work with IKEA, so of course I'm I'm a bit biased there. I understand, but it, it, the work has been incredible. The work we've done uh, regarding the, the the reaction to to what do we do? How do we bring cargo out? How do we bring vaccines in? How do we uh, protect the, the 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 you know the staff on the ground? Uh, all that is is been. And there's really a lot to be learned from there. And uh, well, back in 1944, uh, the, the Chicago Convention already had an article on, on uh, epidemic. So it's, it's just uh, uh, to say that, of course, this is learned from the law of the sea and, and the experience from the law of the sea. We learned a lot from the law of the sea in, in, in uh, innovation um, and we're still learning. So I think I think it's resilience would be would be what what we can work on because some states have shown incredible uh, uh resilience uh, um some shortcomings some is some on a long short term but you can you can definitely i think do a lot with that um and and update the the regulations accordingly i think i think there's a lot that can be done uh, from there i know france is working on that at the moment a bit because uh, we've a uh, French army, you know, which is now the uh, uh, Air Force and Space Force. So it's called the uh, uh, Armée de l'Air et de l'Espace. And to tell you how quickly that went, everybody says in France, it doesn't matter in which area they work, people call it right away, oh, Armée de l'Air et de l'Espace. They say right away. Um, so it's, it's a very, there's a, there's a quick learning uh, curve from, from, uh, from, from there. Uh, and, and, and if, if the army is about something, is definitely resilient. So I think there's going to be a lot uh, from there. Uh, this is would be my my mm. my yeah. two. And, and I think that's a really good message. So Torsten, over to you for the reality check here. Um, you know, you speak with the regulators. We've already talked about failure and success, but do you think our regulators are up to it? Do you think they're up to the challenge or are we relying on old world thinking for new 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 world problems if to put, coin a cliche when it comes to space you know what needs to change or or is everything okay in terms of the regulation of space now well, i'm happy that that it was an easy question from you so yeah I'm not glad. such a difficult <laughs> one that you asked <laughs> me, so okay um i think before we bashing on the regulator i think it is fair to say that those people are very smart very talented mm. people which work in their given framework and they only can operate in this framework given to them so if the legislative framework for them to regulate in is not there what can they do out of this box mm. And I think that's a problem yeah. that we have today. So they do a great job and they are aware of that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, when you talk to the regulators, they are aware of that. They know what to do. When you talk to the ITU, when you talk to all of them, they are aware of that. It's not that mm -hmm. they say, oh, what, really? There are satellites now up in space? Ooh, what can we do with that? No, mm -hmm. these people are smart. The problem, the challenge is how to move this framework. So, and then, it's a call for the politicians, uh, which are not having space on their agenda. And that's something where I say, here's a lack of knowledge as well. And I'm, 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 I'm saying that out very straight. I mean, we have at the moment things going on in Europe, like the initiative of the foreign EU space law. Is that either ever possible in Europe? Is it part of harmonization, whatever. I mean, Ingo has much more answers and much more profound answers than me on that. I think the idea is nice and, and triggers it in the new direction, but is it feasible in the current EU framework that we have? I mean, we have this patchwork of spa national space laws in Europe where countries, uh, where, where companies, where individuals can move within Europe for their flag of convenience to set up their business because it, it suits better to their um, to, to their requirements um, to to use these loopholes or uh, that that are in um, to to make their business. But I think that needs a severe rethinking process. And I know it will be a twenty year process again. And 
we say that all in light of dramatic changes that we are all facing and that's not the pandemic that came over us overnight and we we, we suffered with that and i had the hope that humanity came together to solve this issue but now hey it's solved no let's let's do it it's business as usual but now we have climate change we have the loss of biodiversity and so on and so forth really significant issues that are not will happen in the next 50 years where we all can say yeah my god it's after us we are we are dusted by then no um it happens mm -hmm. this every summer it happened in a, in a speed that nobody has foreseen so do we have the time for all of these regulatory processes and i'm, I'm it sounds might it might sound dramatic here yeah but I don't think we have the time for all these regulatory processes to put in in place to make them smooth. We have actors that just act because they can. The elands of the world, they're just setting rules. And then we have other countries that are too slow to get their stuff in order, like our Germany. I mean, it's it's a shame for me as a German to say, oh, no, we still don't have a law. Hey, but we have maybe a strategy maybe <laughs> if it passes but ah. two weeks ago we cut all our space budget already so we are talking how important space is for germany how important space is for innovation and for whatever to save the world but hey we don't have money sorry for that guys yeah. we have other and, and that's happened in australia we've just cut a absolutely yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. No, but, yeah it's who, interesting who, who you know france or <laughs> so 45 percent well, more please. on the space yeah, but the center I mean, of the universe. There, there's one thing I really admire, France. France set space from the beginning into the right con or put space into the right context, into the strategic context. Yeah. And yes, it might be debatable if the military is the right driver for that. But hey, you choose for that and you went this way all the way. I mean. Germany has a space force as well now, or a space command. Hey, we are happy. We're we're great. Um, but yeah, I, I was just in Berlin, as you know, Thorsten, as a no, guest. I, I can't your, remember <laughs> as a guest of your of the German space command, and I have yeah. to say, they were the most. Um, well, you know the people as well. They were the most erudite, clever, thoughtful people. So anyway, it was it was wonderful. Um, you know, we're getting a whole lot of messages about regulation here. We're getting, you know, Ingo saying the need for speed, balance that against the Axel, the need for safety. You're saying, um, uh, Torsten, we don't have time, you know, yet we need to be cautious, we need to get it right. And it really is regulating for the unknown, you know, so uh, it's it's tough. I mean, we just need to help the regulators help the decision makers move forward in the most pragmatic way and everything is a balance everything is a balance but you know we don't want to have the disasters and then ask, have to... ask yourself why do we have to regulate why do we in, in any case yeah. not just well that's thing. a that's a question we, mm. we, we have to regulate because people are going over their the, the, the behaviors of of or of the the norms of good behavior let's put it that way yeah, for their own benefit, for their for their commercial benefits, for and this re this has to be re rethinked. And I'm I'm my my summer reading this year is the, the Ministry of the Future, um by 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 Kim Robinson, uh, and that triggers a, a few so, uh, pro think, thinking processes. I'm I'm don't don't worry. I'm I'm not getting ra radicalized. I think not that much. Ah. But... Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah. I, I think we have to question the status quo and how we be, behave at the moment, each of us. Yeah, and and, and like these are important messages. Look, we are almost out of time, but let's quickly, Torsten, give give us a couple of the really wonderful questions we've got. Maybe you can combine them or something. We'll hear Ingo and Axel's take on some of these issues. They raise issues of um, double standards, about liability, of environmentalism, of near space. You know, there's so many diverse things. 
Um, where do we start? I'm, I will pick Chris' question here um, again because we are we're running out of time. So, um, Chris, thank you for 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 your question. So, and he asked uh, how to define and regulate regulate near space situated below the common line in the upper atmosphere, uh, upper stratosphere, mesosphere, hmm. as it becomes a more active location for civilian and military activities, including and not limited to balloon platforms for rocket launches. Yeah. Over to you. I would like, I've got a lot to say on this, but first, Axel and Ingo. So near space, is it a concept? Should it be a concept? We talk about high altitude, we talk about pseudo satellites, we talk about the lack of delimitation, we talk about who's responsible for it. We know it's part of sovereignty, but who's responsible? Mm. Who, you know, over to you. Um, let's see, how do we say solve that problem? Um, from the, from the, the, the aviation part, I, I don't think states uh, would uh, like the concept of near space. That that's something that uh, I don't think it's uh, it's going to be sold there. Um, but anything high altitude, I think this is this is the the the, the going to be the part where I mean EASA is already looking at it. I mean it's it's uh, uh, you know it's this is more the the area of the balloons. I think this is pretty much where things and, and particularly why because we had some incidents as you remember uh with this balloon that was uh <laughs> taking a walk um and and this is something that uh because it is directly concerning the military before anything so the military started right away to look at it and to push the governments at least the u.s government and canadian governments to to be involved in the discussion uh, so I think this is where the the the, the balloon as such the concept is is gonna, probably going to be looked at in a very different way uh, um, as it has been so far and by that i don't mean the 80th century montgolfiere i'm talking about of course high altitude balloons is different so this this is i think where the the, the, the debate is going to be uh, is going to be on and this is going to be interesting to see maybe there's going to be a different answer whether you're a civil law country or a common law country i think there's, there's probably mm -hmm. going to be a different type of debate uh, uh, there Mm. Ingo, it's a big commercial area as well. This, let's call it high altitude, whatever. So, where should that be regulated? Where should that fall? I would say it's it's really still in the air law. No, what what I found interesting for for quite many years, um, while space and air law have been quite separated. Besides, very few a handful of countries with active launch activities. No? But now with uh, re-entry, with space tourism, with high altitude platforms, with many several other types of applications, no? the boundaries are again at least in question. No? And and air and space law are certainly coming closer together. So we as I'm a more space lawyer have to look more into air law and vice versa and more co collaboration and exchange and and we see it already no the uh, in the uk no the regulatory authority moved to to the civil aviation authority and i i'm sure it's not the last one yeah so if if also germany will set up its national space law who will be the competent authority will it be the the dlr space agency will it be the ministry Will it be a new entity or will it be the Civil Aviation Authority? And, and um, well, uh, you all know we also have three micro launcher companies. They are not, mm. not, not yet to, or, or maybe never launching from German territory, but nevertheless, they are German companies. We have a, talks about the North Sea platform maritime and we have some air launch uh, activities in germany so it might well be also uh, i don't know uh, i'm not even aware of any discussions in that area but that also uh, in germany civil aviation authority will be in the driving seat huh? and 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 in many other countries uh, this uh, this discussion is also ongoing and, and we, we might see much more regulators in fact coming from the aviation background or having the double uh, competence and um, that's an that's an interesting development and well I'm looking forward because then I will 
more treats and uh, more work on on airlo which <laughs> unfortunately yeah. usually i don't have so much time uh, but uh yeah. yeah interesting yeah it's interesting so so i've um helped about 20 countries with their national war and one of them was new zealand and when the new zealanders came to me because they had um rocket rocket labs um launching and they didn't have law and they said please Stephen, help us draft our Space Activities Act, which was the name that they tentatively gave to it. And I worked with them for about 18 months and we produced the act, but about halfway through my mandate, they said, oh, Stephen, by the way, we want to change now because we're now looking at high altitude as well. And so you will all know now that, that we've worked on that and I wrote the law and it's called the Space and High Altitude Activities Act. And when I, when we, published that in 2017 and came into force, these old school space lawyers came up to me and said, how dare you, how dare you pollute space law with this other thing which is irrelevant? And I said to them, mm -hmm. well, you know, from a company's perspective, <laughs> they don't care what you call it. They just need to work out how we regulate what goes on above. And as you say, Ingo, that distinction is blurring anyway. And now, of course, with the, some of the more recent things and the technology being developed, and Axel talked about recent events, every country is looking at this. And so New Zealand was actually a trailblazer in that regard. And those people who uh, criticized New Zealand and said they were polluting the purity of space law uh, are nowhere to be <laughs> seen now, which is good. But it's interesting, it just shows that this distinction is being blurred. We've got suborbital, as you say, We've got ICAO having spoken to the space community about the regulation of suborbital, but there's no resolution yet. So I think we've got a lot of work. And I think, Ingo, yes, your practice will increase in the air law as well. Torsten, I think uh, we're out of time and, and we haven't covered everything that we could have, but... Um, I'm, I'm so happy that I, there are still yeah. some topics open are for upcoming yeah. space cafes. So and there said, will be. Yeah, we yes, have to go yes, up yes. number 15 now. <laughs> certainly, <laughs> certainly. Excellent. Uh, Stephen, yeah. can, I, can I just 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 say one thing? I think I, I forgot to say, which I find is very important, is is what is before the the council uh, regarding Australia and the Netherlands against the Russian Federation. This Article Three bis is essentially the right to life. Uh, right mm. to passengers, and this is something that uh, I, for the audience is very important, but I don't take that away. And it's very important because obviously it's the first time that we have right to life uh, before uh, before the council. It's not called as such, but it's essentially what it is. Uh, so here's your connection a bit with criminal air law because uh, I'm also in criminal air law, but not criminal law. So I, I tend to forget about the ICC, but it doesn't mean that there's not uh, some ground <laughs> for you. Uh, Absolutely. That is, that, is, that is just so fascinating. Thank and I'm happily working with you because of, uh, on that, uh, I, I don't care how much time it will take, but because it's uh, very close to my heart and all these lives uh, were gone. And this is something that I don't think any of us can, can accept. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. That's what I want to say. Um, Torsten, it's, uh, it's just been great. We've uh, had such a fantastic discussion. Ingo and Axel, thank you so much for joining us. I, ha I hope you've enjoyed the discussion. I hope the people who uh, in the audience have, and I'm sorry we didn't meet all the questions, but we will cover all these topics as we move forward. So thank you. Um, while I've got the floor, let me just foreshadow our next Space Cafe Law Breakfast. Uh, it'll be, as you can see, on the 21st of September. Uh, two amazing people as well. And uh, Vandenbrucke from Rubata Space uh, Networks and uh, my dear friend Martin Reinders from DLR. So that's why we're going to be in Bonn, uh, I think, uh, for our next breakfast. Please join us. Um, these two uh, guests that we have there have had so much experience from the regulatory viewpoint from, and from a whole range of specific uh, issues. And they will carry on, I think, some of the excellent discussion we've had today. So with that, again, let me thank everybody. Axel, thank you so much. Uh, Ingo, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. I wish we had more time. And of course, we will speak in other for us soon. 
Um, and Torsten, yeah. as always, as I said, nothing compares to you on this sad day, but nothing compares to you. Thanks for uh, hosting us as always on this wonderful platform and uh, over to you. Yeah, I'm hand, handing back to uh, Eleanor to leave us what is left before we are going into a summer break for the Space Cafes next week. So we have two exciting events. So Eleanor, are you with us? Yes. Uh, so yeah, before we say goodbye, let me remind you of upcoming events. Today's afternoon at 4 p.m. we in Central European time, we have our Space Cafe Benelux by Dr. Heike Poignan featuring Rudy Scharnen for a dive into the European quantum communication infrastructure. And tomorrow at 4 p.m. again, we have our Space Cafe Israel by Meidat Pariente with Ayelet Gelili, Chief Financial Officer at Tahir Space. And August, as you've heard, is a summer break for us. So we are a group in September with physical events and our Space Cafes. And mar so mark your calendars for the 8th of September, 4 p.m. Central European time, for a Space Cafe Austria by Sabine Pongrumer. On the 27th of September, we're going to have our Space Cafe Black Ops by Dr. Emma Gatti with Dr. Namrata Goswami. And on the 29th at 4 p.m., again, we have our Space Cafe Scotland by Angela Matisse. All events, as always, are going to be online on Eventbrite for your subscription. And we would love to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And don't forget to sign up for our daily and our bi-weekly newsletters. And if you'd like to treat yourself with something special, become a space watcher today. Your support will, your support will help us. So go to our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global and uh, your support. And um, we need your support to continue our work. So thank you very much. Thank you all for your interest today. Thank you, Ingo and Axel, for your inspiring chat and being our guests. Thank Stephen, thank you. Have you been happy with the program? Oh, it just gets better and better. And I say that all the time, but it's great to have incredible friends, incredible people, and a great discussion. I've learned so much. And already looking forward to being back in Germany in two months' time with uh, Anne and Martin, and I hope everybody can join again. So thanks again. Amazing. So thank you again to the entire team behind the scenes for doing this great job week by week again. I hope you all stay safe and healthy. Thank you for joining us. I hope to see you next week. Well, this week and in September. In September, in the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a space watcher. Bye. Enjoy your holidays. Have a great summer. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.